We give him everything we have because he's worthy. We give him everything we have because he's worthy. Hallelujah. Come on, sing one last time. One last time. Say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving me keys and a monitor. Now can you turn it down a little bit? Psalm 25, verse 14. This is not a verse for the screens. It's a verse for prophecy. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. And to them, he makes known his covenant, or as the new King James would say, he makes known his secrets. <clears throat> Pastor John, tonight is a night of confirmation and affirmation for you because the Lord said something simple to me watching you. He said, that's my friend. But here's what comes with that. The verse I just spoke. I spoke over you. You just didn't know it because to the friends of God belong the secrets of God. The context in which God has invited you to minister is one in which you are a carrier of a sound that is familiar to the body of Christ that draws them to a place. 
But the context that the Lord is getting ready to take you to is a sound that is familiar to their spirit, but not to their ear, because the sound is going to come from you. You. are being upgraded to a place of permission in the realm of the prophetic. Hear me clearly. There are songs that God gives you in a place of intimacy in your private time. That's what makes him call you his friend. But as a result of your friendship with God are gonna come the secrets of God. And as the secrets of God are revealed to you, so the prophetic is going to be unlocked in you. There is a wind of God that's getting ready to, to come over you, to overshadow you, and impart into you this gift and this mantle. And some are not going to understand the shift, and even you are not necessarily going to understand the shift always. But tonight is a night where the Lord chooses to do so to release in you a place of permission. Because there is, you would never voice it this way. So the Lord voices it for you this way. There is a level of frustration that has come even in the open doors that have been given because there is a place that God is inviting you to that you have not yet given yourself permission to go to. And because you've not yet given yourself permission to go there, those who are around you have not necessarily given you the permission to go there. But the Lord says to those who fear me, I call them friend. And to friends, I give secrets. And so as a result, there is going to come on you a prophetic insight, a prophetic understanding, a prophetic song, and a prophetic declaration that's going to bust you out of the limitation that you've been in, even though you don't feel like you've been limited. This has been a great season for you with great and many open doors, but you've been placed there strategically by God as a prophetic voice. And so Father, I thank you for this release in him. I thank you for the Ruach of God the breath of the Lord, the mind of the Lord, the word of the Lord becoming so active in him that he will feel like Jeremiah. I tried not to say it, but every time I tried to hold it back, it was like a fire that was shut up in my bones. And so, Father, I thank you that you taught him in the secret place it doesn't have to be popular. He needs to be known by you. I thank you that you taught him in the secret place and you've hidden him in the secret place until now because you needed someone in the earth that you could trust to be your friend and to say what you are saying, even if it's unpopular. So Father, I thank you for the fire that is shut up in his bones. I thank you for the wind of God that now breathes upon him. And I thank you that now you pour out your spirit in a fresh way. Touch him now, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. There is a breaking because this is a place of permission. This is a place of permission. This is a night of an upgrade and a place of a permission. Father, release it in him. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. The Lord is in this room. Would you lift your hands and honor him now? Would you lift your hands and honor him now? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
there's a lady in this room with a pain in your left arm. The Lord is healing. Where are you? Where are you? Come. Come. He has to heal it because he reveals to heal. He doesn't reveal to be cruel. He reveals to heal. And I, the reason I'm saying he has to heal is because sometimes there's different manifestations that happen in my body when he's doing something. Sometimes I feel heat. Um, this manifestation I don't like, I feel the pain. So I want him to heal you so I can stop feeling it. <laughs> Would you lift up your hands, both of you, if you can, if you can, if you can. This is, a, this is the act of faith. <clears throat> Father, touch these ladies. In the name of Jesus, from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, from this night on, this pain goes in Jesus' name. It goes. Lord, take it away. Receive the reward of your suffering. Receive the reward of your suffering. Touch her now. Lord, touch your daughter. Touch your daughter. Let there be a release of all that she's been carrying. It's more than pain. Let there be a release of everything she's been carrying. In Jesus' name, the weight goes. The struggle breaks. That which you've been carrying is now the Lord's. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. Take it, Jesus. Receive the reward of your suffering and take it now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I promise you this is not how I plan to start. I'm just following the Holy Spirit. I'm just following the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Did you know that COVID-19 did not stop God's ability to heal? He's still a healing God. He's still a healing God. I know we sound like we're crazy when we just saw a million people in our nation succumb to a virus to talk about healing, but he is still a healing God. Some of y'all don't act like you believe it. Some of you need to recover your faith right here. Restore your faith and let it be stirred up to say God can heal anything. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 See what the Lord has done. 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 I don't know if you can see what I see, but see what the Lord has done. He just unlocked something. He just released something in this atmosphere. See what the Lord has done. He is still moving. He is still proving just how great he is. Hallelujah.
Can I tell you something about moments like this? We can, because God always wants to do more than we think he does, we can stay here flowing all night. But there is a truth that's attached to this. Can I tell you the truth is? Your level of hunger determines how far we go. Jesus when I was younger I would travel to certain places and the, the metaphor I give is it would be like I would charge hell with a water pistol <laughs> not that I didn't have power that's not what I'm talking about I'm just saying like I was determined that we're gonna get there we're gonna do whatever and I, I stopped working myself to death over atmospheres that weren't hungry And uh, you may think, well, that's awful arrogant of you. But the truth of the matter is, when Jesus went to his hometown, the Bible says that he did not do very many miracles there. It says because of their unbelief. And so because we, because we read that, we look at unbelief as if it's like kryptonite to Jesus. But unbelief doesn't stop him from healing. He heals in the presence of faith and he heals in the presence of skeptics. We see this because in Luke chapter 5, when they brought the paralyzed man to Jesus and, and they cut a hole in the roof and brought him into the presence of Jesus because the people were crowding around him, there's a couple of truths in this. Number one, the Bible says seeing their faith. The Bible never speaks of the faith of the paralyzed man. So sometimes we like to accuse people, well, you didn't get healed because you don't have faith. R hogwash. Rubbish. <laughs> he can heal in the presence of faith and he can heal in the presence of skeptics. Your unbelief doesn't affect his power. <laughs> How do we know that he heals in the presence of faith and skeptics? Because he did it at the same time in that, that scripture. The man who brought the friend had faith. So he moved. The Pharisees who were watching were skeptics. In the same place, at the same time, faith and skeptics, just like here. <laughs> I know when I'm in a room of faith, I know when I'm in a room of skeptics, and I know when I'm in a room of both. Ah, uh, you don't want me to be that prophetic tonight. <laughs> Jesus, knowing the thoughts they didn't even say anything. Knowing their thoughts spoke to their skepticism and said, which is easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven and rise, take up your bed and walk. But so that you will know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. He looked at the man and said, rise, take up your bed and walk. He responded to faith and dealt with skepticism at the same time. My point is that unbelief does not affect the power of Jesus doesn't stop him. The reason why he did not heal in his hometown was not because of their belief in his ability. It was their belief in his divinity. Because he didn't heal many, he did heal some. If you read the scripture, the Bible says he healed some. So because he's compassionate and he has power. So he did heal some. He didn't heal many because he knew that it would become a sideshow because what they would say is, look at what Joseph's boy can do. But the point of healing is the point to the father. This isn't the son of Joseph moving in the miraculous. It's the son of God moving in the miraculous. And because he knew it would not change their belief in his divinity, he moved on. What's the point? Your hunger determines what he does in a moment. What am I trying to tell you in this moment? Other people have just been healed without me calling it out, just by their hunger. 
This is not the season of the sideshow when we come and see what the man of God can do, when we determine whether or not it's gonna happen for me or not, or we think we're not gonna get healed unless they call us out. How about just get in the presence of Jesus? Just get near to him. Just touch the hem of his garment and watch what happens. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. In other words, if you've seen Jesus heal two people in front of your eyes, he did not just come for them. He came for all. He came for anyone who wants a touch from God. He came for anyone who wants to receive from him. He came. That's what he's in the room for. That's the river that's flowing. If I were you, I would jump in. I don't have to preach a word for you to jump in to this river, to jump in to this flow, and you will discover that some of you who came in one way are leading a completely different way in the name of Jesus. We haven't even started preaching yet, but the presence of the Lord is in this room. And so for that reason, we give him glory, we give him honor, we give him praise, because there is no one like him. There's none who can pass to him. He's God all by himself. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Holy One. He is the Great One. He is the only one who is worthy to be praised. And as we lift him up, he begins to move. As we honor him, he begins to move. As we give him Praise. He begins to move. He begins to heal. Chains begin to break. Breakthrough begins to happen. Deliverance happens in the presence of the Lord. John, are you ready for another touch from the Lord? He did not put you around a healing anointing and a prophetic anointing for you to just facilitate it. He put you around it so that you would operate in it. Can one of your friends stand with you just in case the Lord hits you again? I don't want you to hit something. <laughs> I'm not saying you have to do something. I just want to be careful. Father, there is a healing anointing you want to place on him that will be resident in him. He's never been covetous in his heart. There is a desire in him to see more when he goes places. So, Father, would you put the more in him and on him? Let there be an anointing for healing and rest on him. Let it drop on him now. In Jesus' name, touch your son and give it to him. Like an oil being poured upon him from the Spirit of God, not from a man, but from you so that he will be able to say that my impartation came from the Holy Spirit. Let it happen now. Touch him, Lord. Pour your oil on him. Pour your oil on him.
Behold, the days are coming. As in Amos, where the plowman shall overtake the reaper. We are in those days, biblically. But there's coming an acceleration to you and your wife. For this last season has been one of an unspoken frustration. The unspoken frustration is how is it that we're able to see the effect of our apostolic work outside of our house. But there's some things that we long to see inside of the house that we have yet to see. There is a people that we've been forming and laboring for, but there seems to be a delay. Tonight, delay is broken. There has been a resistance in this region against you, a spirit that is afraid of your influence, but tonight its power is broken. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And so you are in the days now where sowing and reaping are going to happen at the same time. There is going to be a great acceleration that takes place where you are going to see that by the time the word is released from your mouth, there comes the answer. For this is a season of answers for you, man of God. This is a season of answers for you, woman of God. And as a result, the Lord is upgrading you again. There is a wind of authority that is coming to you over this region as you begin to speak the word of the Lord, you are going to see that not just people move, mountains move, and principalities move in the name of Jesus. Pour out your spirit upon both of them, I pray in the name of Jesus. Touch them now in Jesus' name. So there's a heavy weight of an anointing here. There is a heavy weight of an anointing here. There is a heavy weight of the anointing and the power of God. God not only is shifting your leaders, he is shifting your house. He's not just shifting your leaders, he is shifting the entire house. What you have been fighting against, the power of it is broken in the name of Jesus. We stand in our level of authority and we speak to the regional spirit that has been trying to hold this thing back. It is called religion. Your power is broken. Your power is broken. Your power is broken. Your power is broken. Your days are numbered. We declare in the name of Jesus, you must move. God is doing something in your pastors right now. He's doing something in your pastors right now. If I were you, I'd be praying, I'd be praying, I'd be praying because what happens in them is going to happen in you. What happens in them is going to happen over you. And those of you who have been fighting this same devil, it's about to be broken over your life in the name of Jesus. Revelation is about to flow like never before. You are standing under an open heaven. That which has been blocked before is now being released and removed and you are standing under an open heaven. Jesus, the master, has declared it to be so. told you we're not in the last season anymore. We're not in the last season anymore. The season has shifted and there is an open heaven.
Would you say these words with me, Lord? Make me like a child. Say it again. Say, Lord, make me like a child. This is important because the spirit of religion says, I know that already. And it's the thing that opposes revelation because the spirit of religion says, I know that already. But if we're going to enter into kingdom days, we must enter like a child. Say, Lord, make me like a child. Come on, I need you to say it because what you're actually doing is the antithesis of the spirit that is trying to hold back this region and trying to hold back even this church. But say, Lord, make me like a child. I want to sit at your feet and I want to learn like a child. I, I want to be in awe and wonder of what you do. I want you to wow me. I want you to amaze me. I want you to blow my mind. I want to learn things. I want to see things. I want to experience things. I want to do things. And I'm not there yet, but Lord, make me like a child. I'm trying to tell you, you're making that spirit really angry right now. Lord, make me like a child. You're making that spirit really angry right now. It's trying to convince you that you've known it, you've seen it, you've been there and done that. But behold, I do a new thing. Behold, I do a new thing. Behold, I do a new thing. What the Lord is doing is he's forcefully bringing you into a place. Before I say a word from the scripture, what he's doing is he's demonstrating what is available to everybody who wants it. He's demonstrating what is available to everybody who wants it. I wonder in this room, are there a hungry people? Are there a desperate people? Are there a people with the cry who say we want whatever you're doing? Luke chapter 24 initiates what we call the hunger test. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus is walking with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And as he's talking to them, he's revealing what the scriptures say about him up until that point. And later in the descriptor, the scripture says to us that their hearts did burn as he spoke with them within them. But the reason why we call it the hunger test is simply this. When they got to their destination, the Bible uses these interesting words. It says Jesus acted as if he was going to keep going. Which means that he didn't actually want to. He was just looking for a people who would invite him to stay. It's a hunger test. Can, can, you, can you experience God? And then as soon as he came, even though your hearts are burning, you're willing to let him keep going? Did you know that the Lord, for the past number of years, even pre-pandemic, has been visiting houses to see who wants him to stay. And
And some people didn't get the memo. So then what he did is he sent you away from the house to see who wanted to come back and stay. And this has been a season of sifting in the shaking and drifting. The drifting is heartbreaking. Any pastor who has witnessed the drifting away from the faith, if they're a true shepherd of God, has been heartbroken over it. But at the same time, the divine provocation of the Lord has also created a sifting. Now the sifting has also been hard for pastors, but it's been necessary because there's a whole lot of people who gave lip service to wanting revival. They said they wanted it until they found out the cost. And when they found out the cost, they said, I don't know if I want that. They, they, so, so they started to define revival as other things. And as a result of defining revival as other things, there's a genuine, true, open heaven that we are in right now. But many don't recognize it because they're waiting on their idols. To declare it and when I say idols I'm actually talking about mute idol gods that you have empowered idols are dumb they don't talk which means in order for you to hear them it's a projection of what you want Some of y'all missed that all together. It's not them talking, it's your own flesh talking. <laughs> all right, some Bible for you, and then we have to go because people need to take their kids and stuff to school. But let me tell you the kind of season that we're in. And I just want you to know that just because I stopped flowing a word of knowledge does not mean that God stopped healing. Wow, Lord, you amaze me. Thank you, Jesus. Father, you are already here. Your spirit is already moving. I pray that you would do more. I pray that you would take these next few moments as we declare your word and do something powerful in this moment. And Father, we're submitted to you. If I start speaking the word and you want to go a different direction, I'll go with you. You want to say something else to your children in a direct way, I'll go with you. Just want to please you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Since you're already standing before I have you sit at our church, we stand when we read the word of the Lord. We do that to acknowledge that the Word of God is unlike any other book. It is a living Word of God. It is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and the discerner of the hearts and the intents of men. We don't read the Word, it reads us. This morning, your pastor read this scripture, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Elisha replied, listen to this message from the Lord. 
this is what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow, in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver, and 12 quarts of barley grain will cost only one piece of silver. The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, that couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. But Elisha replied, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. <laughs> Let me just stop right here and parenthetically insert that your response to the word of the Lord determines your experience. I know that your pastor preached this this morning, but whether you choose to believe it or not determines what you experience. Because the one who doubted it saw it but didn't experience it. I'm going to let that sink in for a moment because <laughs> some of you feel like it's inevitable that whatever is declared is going to happen to you. No, there is a specific response that you must have. Again, religion says, yeah, been there, heard that, tomorrow about this time, all that. But for some people who grab it by faith, it's not just going to be a spiritual tomorrow. For some of you, tomorrow. I need to where the people with faith. For the ladies who were dealing with the arm issue, it wasn't even tomorrow, it was tonight. That's the kind of day that we are in. Hallelujah. Can I keep reading? These were the first two verses. I don't know how many verses you read this morning. You read those two? Okay. Let's start with verse three. Are y'all ready? I'm not going to be long because I took extra time to flow, so I won't be long. Those who come from deeper, they're like, yeah, right. <laughs> but I'm under somebody else's authority. Can't nobody check me at home, so I'll just get up. <laughs> Kidding. Now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the city gates. Why should we sit here waiting to die? They asked each other. We will starve if we stay here. But with the famine in the city, we will starve if we go back there. So we might as well go out and surrender to the Aramean army. If they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. So at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Arameans. But when they came to the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and the galloping horses and sounds of the great army approaching. Let me parenthetically insert here that this was the army of the Lord. I don't have time to teach it to you, but the army of the Lord was always with the prophets at that time. And so when Elisha said to Elijah, I want a double portion, of what is on you, Elisha's response to him was, you've asked a hard thing. In other words, you've asked something I can't determine. I know that, I'm just throwing this out here so you can understand the power of what you're seeing here. I can't determine that for you. And for those in the back who asked for the scriptures, I said I can't give them to you because I don't know what the Lord's going to say yet. So just follow along with me if you can. Um, Elisha said, if you see me when I'm taken up, you can have what you ask for. But if not, you won't. What he was saying to him was, if God has chosen you to carry the mantle that he's given me, he will show it to you when I'm taken. I know... That the way that we like to teach about mantles now, Pastor Josh, is if you just serve the man of God, you know, you'll get his mantle. No. <laughs> it's not that easy. You can bring somebody coffee and tea and hold their Bible for 40 years and not receive what's on them. 
There was a whole school of prophets, but only one got the mantle. All of them actually knew that Elijah was being taken. If you read the scripture, they all knew. They were prophets. <laughs> they all knew. This is not even my message. I just want you to see the power of this moment. They all knew he was being taken, but only one stayed with him and pursued what was on him. It was willing to pay the price to see. And when Elijah was taken, what Elisha saw, he says, my father, my father, you, the horses and chariots of Israel. He saw the horses and chariots of fire. He saw what Elisha had been carrying the whole time was in his mouth was a protection of the nation. And because he saw that, Elijah was aware the entire time that everywhere he was, they were there too. What the four men with leprosy did not know was the prophecy that was given. They didn't even know. They weren't there for it. And so what happened? There are times when the Lord will declare something somewhere over a region, and you may not even be aware of it, but the moment that you make a decision to go after something, God begins to move on your behalf and you didn't even know it. So literally, in order to fulfill the word that was spoken, the horses and chariots showed up and caused the entire Aramean army who was sieging them and causing the famine to flee. Are you here? Okay, you're like, let us sit down. <laughs> Finish reading the scripture. Okay. For the Lord did cause the airman army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and the galloping of horses and the sound of a great army approaching. The king of Israel has hired the Hittites, the Egyptians, to attack us, they cried to one another. So they panicked and ran into the night, abandoned their tents, horses, donkeys, and everything else as they fled for their lives. When the men with leprosy arrived at the edge of the camp, they went into one tent after another, eating and drinking wine, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and hid it. Finally, they said to each other, this is not right. This is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. If we wait until morning, some calamity will certainly fall upon us. Come on, let's go back and tell the people at the palace. So they went back to the city and told the gatekeepers what had happened when the airman, that we went out to the airman camp, and they said no one was there. The horses and donkeys were tethered to the tents, and all were in order, but there wasn't a single person there. Then they gatekeepers shouted the news to the people in the palace. Now, if I were to keep reading, what you would discover is that at that moment, the famine was over, the siege was over. The people got so excited that they ran and they trampled the guy who said that couldn't happen. And Elisha said, you'll see it, but you won't enter it. He saw it, and then he died. You're like, oh, Lord, what a morbid word. What happened? God did exactly what he said tomorrow about this time. <laughs> A few weeks ago, I was attempting to preach this word and there was a move of the spirit. We began to pray and the Lord began to show up in a significant way and so the Lord allowed me to give a summation of the message in three words that he wants me to tell you. And then I'm going to help you understand the season that we're in and then I'm going to go back home. Somebody say these three words with me, go get it. You can be seated, you can be seated. Sunday night is a school night, so I promise I will not be long. Tonight has been set aside in this house as a night of revival. It is because this is on the heart of God. We have heard about the term 
revival. And I think that many of us have maybe mistaken a couple of terms. We have conflated awakening with revival. And because we've conflated awakening with revival, there is a reality for many of us that some of us don't recognize what God actually wants to do in us. God allowed there to be a shaking in the earth for the purpose of awakening his people. Can I say it again? God allowed there to be a shaking in the earth. What, what, what I'm doing right now is I'm actually reorienting you to God's timing. Because for so many of you, you've been so discouraged. Uh, you've been so disillusioned. There's been so much that you've been carrying. There's been so much on your mind that it's almost like for, for preachers to begin to preach prophetically again about prophetic possibilities, you almost feel frustrated hearing it because you're like, okay, well, but, but you said these things and then 2020 happened and 2021 happened and now we're in 2022 and I don't know what's going on now. I don't know what's going on with the country. I don't know what's going on with the economy. I don't know what's going on in my life. I lost my job. I lost this. I lost that. And so I've also lost hope. And it is important that we begin to understand that, that, that God is not only sovereign, but he's providential. And because he's sovereign and providential, that means that if we actually believe that about our God, then what that also means is that he is orchestrating everything. Now, I know that that becomes very difficult, but there is no such thing as chance. And the reason why there's no such thing as chance is because for there to be chance is to say that there is a realm that God doesn't have control over. Now, let me help you because us Pentecostal charismatic people have done something uh, as it relates to the adversary that has elevated uh, his authority in a way that he should not have. Now, what I mean by that is this. It's not that he's not real. He is. You have an adversary who has delegated authority. <laughs> You, you, you have, and it's not that he's powerless. There, there are things that happen in atmospheres, but I need you to understand that what we have done, and, and we've almost adopted mythology into Christianity. We, we've, we've woven it into Christianity, and so therefore we believe that good and evil are equal and opposite forces in the universe. They are not. And as a result, because we live in a society uh, that, that, that glorifies, particularly in our movie culture and everything else, we, we are in a, a society that basically says there has to be a good guy and a bad guy, and that they have pretty much equal things, and that the end is in doubt until the very end, and then of course we all feel better because the good guy always wins. And, and so we've adopted that, and as a result, what we have done is we've actually believed that somehow or another, God and the devil are sitting across from a checker or chessboard playing over our lives as if one move or another actually controls the destiny of our life or the destiny of a generation. And as a result of that, we've exalted the idea of the power of the enemy greater than it needs to be, and we've lessened the sovereignty, the authority, and the power of God. Let me help you with that tonight. The, the sovereignty and the authority and the power of God means this. The devil is not sitting across from Jesus mapping out what's getting ready to happen. He's not across the board. He's a piece on the board. He's one that God moves at his own design and his own pleasure. The way we have said it at church is simply this. If you read the book of Job, you will discover that the devil is nothing but a dog on a leash. He can only do what God allows him to do. He cannot do whatever he wants to do. He can only do what God allows him to do. You are not fighting a devil whose outcome is still to be determined. The Bible says he is defeated and he's under the feet of Jesus and because we are in Christ he's under us
so we have, we have, we have looked at these past couple of years and it's, it's confused some of us. I am not going to lean into this. I'm going to lean into the sovereignty of God because this is what we need to hear. We need to hear that our God is sovereign. The sovereignty of God is what gives the power to the verse that Paul writes when he says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It does not say he causes some things. It does not say he causes few things. It says, and we know, which is the bedrock foundation of our faith. And we know that God causes. We don't wonder. We don't think. We don't hypothesize. We know that God causes all things to work together for good. The sovereignty of God informs in our posture. Because for so many of you, for the past couple of years, the reason why you are disillusioned is because the whole time you've been rebuking a devil and it seems not to move. You've been saying, we rebuke the devil for doing this and we rebuke the devil for doing that and the thing is not moving. And so perhaps if it's not moving, you should say, God, what are you doing? And so God allowed a shaking to happen to the earth for the sake of his people. I know that's not popular, but it is prophetic and it is biblically accurate. I'll stand on it all day long. Sometimes when people sleep hard, you have to shake them to wake them. Let me help you. Revival is for the church. A revived church awakens the possibility of an awakening in the world. In other words, his people had been asleep. And can I, can I mess with you now? The reason why the shaking came is because people were praying for revival. That's the whole reason it showed up. It's because God heard the cry of some people who said sin revival. And because he heard the cry of some people who said sin revival, he said, if you want me to sin revival, it might look a lot different than you think. Sometimes I got to shake you to wake you. The last two years were about shaking you to wake you. In order for there to be revival, something had to be alive first. Something had to be alive that has fallen asleep. And so we don't now talk about a revival that happened outside of us. There must be a revival that happens in us. It, it must be something that, that takes place in us. It is a quickening of our own spirit. It, it is this thing that says, if I've not been praying, I've been awakened now to the possibility of praying. It's this thing that says, if I have not been believing or walking in faith, I must be shaken to begin to believe now that I must walk in faith. If I'm not reading the word, I must be shaken and made alive so that I will begin to read the word. So God will put you in a circumstance to make you search for him. He will put you in a circumstance to make you believe and some of you have been trying to curse the season that God has put you in and I come to announce to you prophetically that God put you in it to send you revival this time that we have entered is the result of a season of divine provocation divine provocation. The, the way that I like to say it, um, our church has heard this, have been stirring on the inside of me for quite some time. There's a phrase in scripture that Jeremiah 29 captures very well. In verse 12, it says, in those days, in those days. Somebody say, in those days. In those days. The reason why this is an important thing for us to say is it says that now God has been behind the scenes setting some things up, allowing some things, positioning some things so that in those days when you come to me and pray, I will listen. That is the scripture. In those days when you pray to me, I will listen. Can I say that again? In those days, because I'm not going to take long. I'm going to ramp up real fast. 
in those days when you pray, I will listen. Oh, I wish you'd hear me. I know it's not, it don't seem deep to you right now. I'm about to go some places that might seem deep, but I'm gonna sit down real quick. In those days when you pray, I will listen. I'm gonna keep saying it. In those days when you pray, I will listen. In those days when you pray, I will listen. God said that to a people who did not like the days they were in. We love this verse right before Jeremiah 29, 12, which is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of good, not evil, to bring you to an expected end or to bring you to a hope and a future. And we read it and we say, yes, God knows the thoughts he thinks towards me. But let's look at it contextually. If we look at it contextually, its meaning is even more powerful. Because if we look at it contextually, this is not just God talking to you. I know we like to co-opt that verse, put it on our mugs and our, our journals and stuff like that and say, God knows the thoughts and things towards me, thoughts of bringing good and all that, right? We love to, to say that. Contextually, this is both the foretelling and forthtelling nature of prophecy. For the people in Jeremiah's day, it was a foretelling nature of prophecy. For us, it's the foretelling nature of prophecy, which is to say that we are able to see the character of God when we read the verse. For them, it was a foretelling thing that was necessary because they were thrust into a season that they hated. God said to them, because of the sin that had gone on for years, that he was not just going to turn a blind eye to it. It had created a group of people who were now willing to entertain idols and have them intermingled with the things of God and the Holy One. And so it would be very much like I'm about, to, I'm about to step on so many of your toes right now that I might not ever get invited back. But it would be very much like, like you saying, I believe God and I believe politics. And so you have determined that the earth is now, or the nation is now uh, in limbo based on what happens on Tuesday. No, no, no. It does not matter who sits in the seat at the White House or in the, the Congress or the Senate. The only thing that matters is who sits on the throne and that is unchanging. Some of us have co-opted speech that we don't even understand is idolatry. We're shaking in our boots, wondering what's about to happen with the nation. Does it go right or left? Does it go red or blue? No, no, no. The only thing that matters is are there a people who know how to get to the throne? Because I don't care if it's blue or red or left or right. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it whichever way he pleases. I don't care what you do. I know who's above you. <laughs> so this intermingling of idolatry that had happened among the people of God, God to answer the prayers of the righteous of the prophetic ones and to adhere to his covenant. You see, the covenant of God was this, because God is so involved in every detail of our life, he's unwilling to allow generations to drift into destruction. So this was what the covenant said. If you obey, you will eat of the good of the land. There were blessings attached to obedience. But there were curses attached to disobedience. Now, sometimes we hear these things and we're like, oh, he's such a cruel God. How could he send curses? How could he allow this to happen? No, it was his love in action. Because what he was saying was, if you get off course, I'm going to make you so uncomfortable that it'll put you back on course. Can you hear this tonight that the judgment of the Lord is actually an instrument to put people back on right path? Okay, so 
Solomon understood it. That's why Solomon prayed what he prayed. When he prayed in 2 Chronicles 6, and he said, God, if people get off course and you send famine and pestilence and all these other things, if they come and they pray, would you hear from heaven and forgive them? And God's answer was yes, I've heard your prayer. And if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, yes, I will answer your prayer. I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins. Solomon wasn't just praying something random. He was praying according to the covenant blessings and cursings. He was saying, God, I know that if people get off course, you said you're going to do this. But I'm asking you that if they turn to you, would you send revival? God said yes. So now, in Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29, y'all still here? In Jeremiah 29, what happens is God has to send a prophet to bring a word of correction and encouragement at the same time. Because what happened was, the prophecy was this. You are going into a 70-year captivity. You're not going to like it. But go ahead and be comfortable because this is the result of the love of God. Now, he didn't say it that way. They didn't know it that way. That's why we know that God had to send him to say what he said in verse 11. Because contextually what is happening is the people are in a moment where they hate where they are. They hate where they feel like God has put them and they feel like, why are we here? And so what happened was there was a number, uh, there was a prophetic voice in that time that raised up and, and told them lies and said, God's not angry at you. It's only going to be a two-year captivity. Don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. And they wanted to believe that. So God sent Jeremiah back to say, no, no, no. It's going to be more than two years. In fact, it's going to be 70 years. But, and so you might as well go ahead and build houses and plant gardens and marry and all that kind of stuff. Don't put life on hold. And in fact, I'm sending you into captivity, but I want you to pray for the city that I placed you in. Pray for the peace of it because by its fortune will be your fortunes they're tied together so I'm giving you an assignment while you are there and they hated it but God said I know the plans that I have for you I know that you may not know them but I know the plans that I have for you says the Lord and they are plans for good and not evil to bring you to an expected end or to bring you a hope and a future. In other words, I sent you into the season that you did not like to preserve you, not to destroy you. Are you hearing me by the Spirit of the Lord? And after this time, after this time is over, in those days, when the time that you did not like is over when the season that you did not understand is over in those days when you pray I will listen okay can I tell you we are in or entering an in those days season you've been hanging out with me at Deeper for the past few weeks, you know that this is a season that we call the Kairos days. Notice for those of you who are hearing me for the first time, I did not just say a Kairos moment. That is what we typically hear. We typically hear Kairos moments. But we are in a very interesting intersection right now prophetically. We are in a Kairos moment within a Kairos day. We are in a Kairos moment within a Kairos day. For those of you who are like, what in the world are you talking about? I'm talking about Greek, a Greek word for time, which is this, this, there, there are several Greek words for time, one of them being chronos, which is um, where we root our chronological or linear time, and the other being kairos, which is a, a, what denotes a set time or God's time or the favorable time or the accepted time or what the scripture defines as due time. Somebody say due time. Now here's the part where the devil wants to keep you blinded. 
and we need to take the blinders off of the body of Christ. There was and is a due time. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 tells us about God's due time. In due time, he sent Christ. Due time represents God behind the scenes setting everything up to bring us to a place in which he releases something in the earth. And there was a specific due time that God was waiting on in order to send Christ. Now let me tell you how amazing our God is. He could have sent him at any time, but he chose to send him at a time where the modern world had been consolidated into one language because he allowed or allowed the raising up of Alexander the Great, which Zechariah prophesied about in Zechariah chapter 9, in order to conquer the entire world so that the entire world would be subdued under one language and a system so that when he sent Christ, the whole world could get the gospel. Due time. I'm more mind blown about that than you are, but that's all right. <laughs> due time. Somebody say due time. What is known as the right time. While we were yet sinners, at the right time, God sent Christ to die for the ungodly. There was a due time, there was a right time. Now, we are in a time biblically defined as the last days. What are the last days? Biblically, the last days are all of the days between the resurrection and the second coming, which means we're in them. You don't have to try to get out your prophecy calendar and say, okay, well, Russia fired a missile, and so that means that we're here and we're there. And no, 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 no. We are in the last days. And there are promises that are attached to the last days. But here is the greatest promise that's attached to the last days, and I'm about to affect your prayer life in a moment and sit down. The greatest promise attached to the last days is this. All the promises of God have been fulfilled in Christ. Uh, the, the way, that's how the New Living Translation said that the way that, that most of you know it is this. All the promises of God are yes and amen. But what that actually means is that all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. Say this with me. All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. Say it again. All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. You're not saying it like you believe it. Say all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. Say it again. All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. You say, what does this have to do with revival? Everything. All right, y'all gonna stay with me for five more minutes? Yeah. Everything up until Christ was a type and shadow of what's available at all times now. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus walks into the temple, he finds the place in Isaiah where he reads these words The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim that the captives are free and that the year of the Lord's favor are the acceptable time. And then he sits down after reading this. Everyone in the Bible says is looking at him. And he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Uh, In Leviticus 25, Pastor Josh, it outlines something called the Jubilee. Where every 50 years, the things that Jesus read in Luke chapter 4 from the book of Isaiah happened every 50 years. It was a type and shadow. It was looking forward to something that there comes a moment in time where Jubilee is no longer every 50 years. Jesus was saying, I am the Jubilee that what was 
50 years you had to wait, now it's fulfilled in your hearing, which means that the moment that he said it, the promises of God became a perpetual open heaven. Can I declare to you where we are right now? What the Lord has done is he's positioned his people to awaken us to the reality that you are not waiting on God. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on a people who actually want what he's released. He's waiting on a people who recognize that every promise of God has been fulfilled, which means this. When I pray, I'm not praying for a future thing. I'm in the days of the finished work, which means that if he's done it and if he said it, it's available to me right now. God positioned us for an in those days moment when you pray, I will listen. I have put you in the due time, not just the Kairos moment, but the Kairos days, which are the days of the finished works. The first miracle of Jesus, Apostle Raleigh, was a demonstration of Kairos. <laughs> Let me prove it to you. Jesus and his boys show up to a wedding in Cana. When they show up to the wedding, <laughs> you see it already. When they show up to the wedding, Jesus' mother says, um, Jesus, they've run out of wine. And Jesus said, woman, what does this have to do with me? It's not my And here's my theatrical interpretation. Mary rolled her eyes and said, whatever, Jesus. I know who you are, and I heard what you said. You said that the time of the favor of the Lord in the acceptable year is now, which means that the days of favor are on us right now. And you said that today this scripture is fulfilled in our hearing. So I don't want to hear anything about time anymore. I don't want to hear you tell me it's not time. It's now. Uh, whatever he tells you to do, go and do it. <laughs> so Jesus is like, oh. This will show you what persistent faith will do. Jesus, now moving, says, um, go pour some water in these pots. They pour water in the pots. And he says, okay, now draw it out and take it to the master of the ceremonies. And the master of the ceremonies drinks the wine and says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Most people, they serve the good stuff first. And then when everybody's had their fill, they bring out the cheap stuff. But you've saved the best until... Now, but that's not the part. In order for water to be turned into wine, there had to be a process of fermentation. But what Jesus did to demonstrate the power of Kairos is he reached in and took time out of the equation. He took time out of the equation, which means that Kairos moment means that at any time, all things are possible. stop but let me tell you where we are this is upsetting every religious devil every religious spirit that wants to put revival into the future if you will place a demand on it if you actually cry out for it if you actually believe for it, what you will discover is that there's nothing that will hold it back from the people who put a demand on it now. Okay. Let me tell you how this works. Let me tell you how this works. This is where we are. Isaiah, prophesying about the future, says this. With his stripes you are healed. He is looking forward but speaking present. Can I tell you the days we're in? Peter, looking on the other side of the cross, says by his stripes, 
you were healed. It's an already done that happened. Let me tell you what was happening while Jesus was walking the earth. This people were running into the mysteries of God without knowing it. People who were outside of covenantal promises were getting blessings. In Matthew chapter 8, there was a centurion came to Jesus outside. He's a Gentile, outside of the covenantal blessing of God. He comes to Jesus and he says, um, Jesus, my servant is at home sick. And Jesus says, I will come and heal him. And he says, no, you don't have to come. You just say the word. And my servant will be healed because I understand authority. I, I, I have people that are under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. And I've noticed about you that when you say stuff, the kingdom realm breaks out, stuff begins to happen. So I don't even need you to go to the house I, if you just say the word. And Jesus says, I've never seen such great faith like this, even among the covenantal people that I've been sent to, which is to say that this man is asking for something because he sees in me a capacity to do something in which he refuses to wait for it to be time. Gentiles kept busting the timeline by asking Jesus for blessings that they didn't even have a right to and Jesus was doing it. How is that even possible when the cross of Calvary had not happened? I tell you a mystery in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 before the foundation of the world the lamb was slain. They were tapping in to something that was available that had not yet happened in time but because of faith they learned a principle time obeys faith <laughs> what is available to us right now everything that's why it doesn't have to be a healing service for people to get healed you don't have to invite prophet such and such to get a word Everything that's in him is available at all times. That's why I ask the question, is there a hunger in this room? Because if there's a hunger in this room, revival doesn't have to be a night. It can be a season. It can be a perpetual open heaven. It's something that God wants to release to a people who will place a demand on it. He put us in position to say, you are in those days that when you pray, I will listen. When you pray, I will listen. When you pray, I will listen. Listen, now let's take the next 60 seconds and pray. Lift up your voice and pray. When you are in an open heaven, anything is possible. When you are in an open heaven, there's perpetual revival. When you are in an open heaven, there is healing available. When you are in an open heaven, there is breakthrough available. When you are in an open heaven, the power of the Lord is present to do whatever he wants. Would you pray? 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 Would you lift up your voice and pray? Would you lift up your voice and pray? Would you lift up your voice and pray? I'm telling you that what is happening in this season for every believer under the sound of my voice who will hear what I'm trying to say, your revival is coming through prayer. The revival that God is sending to the earth is coming through the vehicle of prayer. It is an immutable law. No repentance, no revival. No cry, no revival. No prayer, no revival. But for those who will pray, the future belongs to those who will pray. Revival belongs to those who will pray. It's what the enemy doesn't want you to know. He does not want you to know that God has positioned you. He has positioned you to pray. He brought you through this shaking to get you to pray. He took you through this season to get you to pray so that he could give you what he wants you to have. Revival is not coming because you come to see a man. It is coming when you pray. This is the next revival and outpouring of the Spirit of God for this nation. For those who are willing to pray, you will see revival. For those who are willing to pray, you will see revival.
I'm just getting my break. I'm going to pray and sit down. The Lord's been meeting us in this place. Father, I thank you that right now as we pray, our prayers are heard by you. I thank you that as we pray, we can have this confidence and know that as we stand here, you have positioned your people. You have positioned the body for a move of the spirit because you have placed us in an open heaven. And so now, Father, I pray for a shifting of the winds in this region. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that that which has been dark clouds now pass in Jesus' name. And I thank you that you caused there to be break through and you cause there to be even like the sunbeams of light coming through father i thank you that even now you will cause it to be a stirring in this atmosphere father i thank you that you will cause there to be a stirring of breakthrough in this atmosphere father i thank you that you will begin to burden your people in the place of prayer i thank you that you begin to awaken your people in the place of prayer father i thank you that that which has been complacent will now be broken in the name of jesus those who have been under and operating under the stupor of a religious spirit they will be moved out of that place now in Jesus name that which has been trying to oppose the move of God even in this house we break its power now in the name of Jesus that which is trying to oppose the movement of the spirit of God even in the place of worship we break its power now Father I thank you that even in this moment you begin to release an unrestrained praise and an unrestrained worship Father I thank you that you begin to even cause an alibi Pastor Box anointing to begin to break through in this place. Those who do not care what they look like. Those who do not care what they sound like. Those who only care about anointing Jesus. Those who only care about being with Jesus. Father, I thank you that those will not be, they will not be people who are controlled by ridicule. They will not be people who are controlled by opinion. They will not be people who are controlled by man. But Father, I thank you that the Spirit of God will begin to be awakened in them in the name of Jesus Father we declare now in Jesus name that you begin to awaken your people you begin to stir your people you begin to shift your people you begin to move your people that there will be a movement that would happen in the realm of the spirit and there will be a movement that happens in our spirit Father I thank you for a breaking taking place in Jesus name Father I thank you that you break the mold I thank you that you break complacency I thank you in the name of Jesus that you begin to stir your people that sons and daughters will begin to rise in the mighty and strong name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for our move of intercession that begins to happen in this place. Father, I thank you that even as you begin to move by the power of your spirit, you will begin to birth intercession in the hearts of your people. Father, I thank you that even as you birth intercession in the hearts of your people, you will begin to release the secrets of heaven. You will begin to release the secret counsel of the Lord. And Father, I thank you that in this house among your people you draw out a remnant those who will be your friends and set them on fire in the name of Jesus we proclaim and declare the fire of the Lord we proclaim and declare the fire of the Lord to be birthed and stirred in the house of God Father I thank you that idols now come off of the altars of the hearts of men and women and Father I thank you that the consuming fire of the Holy Ghost begins to move throughout this place in the name of Jesus. Father, we walk in authority. We walk in boldness. We walk in audacity and we declare in Jesus' name that you shift the people from one place to another. That you move the people from one place to another in the name of Jesus. Father, shake us up. Wake us up. 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 In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that you begin to hear the cries of your people. You hear the longings of your people. You hear the heart of your people. And Father, I thank you that you have moved us into this place by your divine will, by your divine purpose, by your counsel in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you're even going to draw your people from the north, south, east, and west, and we speak to the wind from the north, south, east, and west, and we say, breathe, O oh breath of God, breathe, O oh breath of God, make us uncomfortable if you need to, shake us up, move us, provoke us, 
experience in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that there'll be a sound that you put in your people that will begin to rise in this room and rise in this region in the name of Jesus. Lift up your voice here. Lift up your voice here. Lift up your voice here. Lift up your voice. This is the day that we are in. This is the day that we are here. It is the day of the open heaven. It is the day of the open heaven. It is the day of the perpetual access to the heavenly realm. It is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. We are in and in those days moment. Pray. There's a shifting, there's a breaking, there's a moving. We declare it in the strong, mighty, powerful, matchless, high name of Jesus. One more time, lift up your voice and let a mighty roar go through this place. Lift up your voice and let a mighty roar go through this place. Let the sound of intercession be stirred. Let the sound of prayer be stirred. And never forget what it sounds like. Never forget what it feels like. This is what the Lord has invited you into. This is what he brought you into. You will see revival if you will pray. Somebody give him praise right now. Somebody go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Come on. Come on, giant. Do not relent. Do not relent. Do not relent. Throw up your hands and pray. Decree it and declare it. Bind it and loose it. Speak it. Come on, pray. I hear the Lord say this very night, you're going to begin to walk in the power of what you prayed. This week is a week of manifestation. If you believe it, give God the glory right now. James 5, 17, the fervent prayer, the fervent prayer. The fervent prayer, the fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Is there anybody here that's in right standing with God? If that's you giving praise, that your prayer releases your victory. Ma, 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 ma. Come on, lift up your hands. Come on, come on. Say, ma, 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 shata. Somebody's children are going to turn around this week. Somebody's family is turning around this week. Somebody's money is turning around this week. That financial thing. Doctor's reports are going to shift in the next 30 days. I hear the Lord say it. I'll tell you, Pastor William, it was like you have been with us this week. Last Tuesday, something got in our prayer time, actually last week, but strongly last Tuesday. We usually meet as a staff on Tuesdays and pray, but something hit the room early in the morning. And from that point, we said, we're gonna pray every day and we're gonna fast lunch. So we've been praying militant, intense, our whole staff has been coming together and praying heaven down. And I don't know about you, but I feel like something has shifted in the atmosphere. Come on, prayers of supplication, prayers of intercession, prayers of travail. God is doing something in this moment. So even when you spoke over John, John has, you know, how many of y'all love Pastor John? He's a son. I love him with all my heart. John, this last conference, I saw you flowing in the prophetic. You started saying somebody's being healed right now in their knee. God's healing. I have never seen you do that before. 
but get ready, son. You're about to move into a place you've never been before. God is unlocking something. How many of you are ready for God to unlock whatever he wants to unlock? So I believe today has been a day of destiny and power. I believe today God has ushered in something that is so current and so fresh. Who needed the entire day today? Did you need it all? So I think that the reward of this season, one of the many rewards of being almost 59, is that God has given me so many precious sons and daughters. And one that I love so much is Pastor Josh Carter. Don't you love him? Amen. Son, I want you to come up here and I want you to pray over this house, not a dismissal, because we ain't going to miss this, but I want you to make a pronouncement that there has been such a breaking in this moment that God has done something so profound and prolific that we're just going to walk in it. Come on now. How many of y'all ready to walk in breakthrough the entire week and beyond? And I want you to pronounce the blessing of the Lord over us as we depart. Holy Spirit, teach us how to pray. Father, for every area in our lives, God, that we don't know how to pray in this season, Spirit of God, teach us how to pray. Father, Lord, so that we, that we might walk, God, in every promise, Lord, that you have prepared for us. That, Father, even as we walk out of these doors this night, God, that we would be prepared and equipped, God, to do everything, Lord, that you called us to do. Father, I pray, teach us how to pray. Father, I pray over every man and every woman, God, who received this word by faith, that, Father, now as they set their feet outside of these doors, that there would be authority and anointing and blessing and favor that follow them. That, Lord, the fragrance of heaven, Lord, would trail each man and woman. That those that they are around, God, would smell it and taste and see that the Lord is indeed good. I pray, God, that this beginning of time, this beginning of moments, God, Lord, would blow our minds in the days to come. Every man, every woman, and God, I pray over our children, Lord, that you would bless our children, God, that revival would not just come to men and women, but God, our young people, Lord, our children would experience, Lord, the very same thing we have stood in this evening. And Father, we give you glory. We give you praise for what we're about to see. Bless now your people in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, if you believe in somebody, say amen. Come on, if you believe in somebody, say amen. If you're thankful for the word and you love one another, put those hands together, shake a few hands, and say, God bless you. We love you, Calvary, and we will see you next Sunday right here, 1010. God bless you, and let revival come.